From the moment I was born, I wanted to explore the world. As a child, I was always discovering something new. When I got my first set of wheels, I learned something about myself. I was born to ride. On this trip, I'm heading south for a three-week, eight-state road trip. My starting point is the lush green forest of the Pacific Northwest. From there, I'll make my way east across the loneliest highway in America. Riding into Moab, I will test my off-road riding skills on the famous Slick Rock Trail, then look for the million-dollar views in Colorado. I will enjoy the remoteness of Wyoming before fulfilling my cowboy dreams in Montana. Finally heading home across the Lolo Pass in Idaho, I'll arrive back in Washington to catch the ferry to Canada. That's right. Once again, I start my journey with a ferry ride from Vancouver Island. This time I'm sailing across the Strait of Juan de Fuca on the Coho Ferry. The Coho has been sailing between Victoria and Port Angeles since 1959. And while it's showing its age a bit with the lack of onboard amenities, the views from the top deck more than make up for it. If you're quick, you might even be able to spot a local pod of killer whales. Disembarking from the ferry, I begin my American road trip at the entrance to the Olympic National Park. Covering nearly 1 million acres, the park encompasses three distinct ecosystems glaciated mountains, rugged coastline, and lush temperate forests that the Pacific Northwest is well known for. Wow, look at that. That's amazing. Look at that. The Olympic National Park includes over 73 oh, miles yeah. of absolutely stunning coastline, and it made for a perfect rest stop. Oh man, does that ever look awesome? Holy crap. I gotta stop for a second and check that out. Oh my God, look at that. Stunning. How cool is this? You can ride right onto the beach. <laughs> so awesome. Rest break over, it was time for me to start making my way east across Oregon and up over the Cascade Mountain Range. At a height of just over 14,000 feet, the Cascades extend all the way from British Columbia to the northern part of California. Let's try a scenic route. Is this it here? Shit, look at this road, <laughs> my god. Oregon, right on. <laughs> you guys know how to build some roads. Oh my god. Officially known as Route 242, the Mackenzie Pass is a hairpin filled road that feels like it was just made for motorcyclists. Look at this corner is banged. Oh my god. You guys are killing me. It's banged. Oh my god. Oh. 
Oh my God, look at this place. The road follows an old Indian trail that was used to travel over the Cascades, but due to the large lava flows and steep terrain, many early travelers had to abandon their wagons and continue on foot. Oh, here, Scott Road. Is this called Scott Road? I wanna see what this says. Felix Scott. Let's see what this says. Felix Scott led a crew of 50 men who blazed a trail across Cascade Mountains following an old Indian trail which skirted lava flows. Oh, maybe that's why it's so twisty. Scott hoped to use the new route to take supplies to gold fields in Idaho. Wow, way to go Felix Scott and the native Indians who built this originally and the lava who made all the corners. Good job. Look at this road. There's no one here. I love it! You know, the other thing that's amazing is what good shape this road is in. It's not like potholes. Okay, ooh, ooh, ooh. I haven't said that. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Okay, 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 okay. You know, there's not a lot of potholes or tar snakes or none of that. It's really nice shape. A little bit of gravel here and there, but that's about it. Wow, look at this. Look at this. Forest fire must have gone through here. Look at this place. As I ascended up over the Mackenzie Pass, I was surprised to suddenly come out of the trees and into this giant lava field. The Boring Lava Field, which was named after the local town of Boring, was once an active lava field with over 90 volcanoes. Definitely not boring during that period of time. But not to worry though, as the last eruption took place over 57,000 years ago. Let's climb up there and see what I can see. In more recent times, NASA has deemed this region to be somewhat comparable to the surface of the moon, and has sent astronauts here to practice walking around in their spacesuits. Holy crap! This is all lava! Well, at one point it was all lava. What is that? Can you go look out there? The best vantage point for viewing the lava field is from the D. Wright Observatory. This observatory was built during the Great Depression and is constructed entirely of the lava stones from the surrounding area. When most people think of the Pacific Northwest, they usually think of non-stop rain. But life on the east side of the Cascade Mountain Range couldn't be any different. Turns out that the Cascades provide a natural barrier to all the moisture that comes off the Pacific Ocean. This moisture turns into rain and dumps on cities like Seattle and Portland, but leaves the rest of the state relatively dry. I'm really surprised how high diverse Oregon is. You go from the coast, which has got those gorgeous beaches. You got that middle section, which is like nice forest. And then here we are, like, look at this place. This is, looks like desert. One thing that this part of Oregon does seem to get a lot of though is wind. I don't know if you can hear it right now, but it is so crazy windy right now. I'm having to like lean the bike over just to go straight. And this, this adventure helmet, this part here is like a sail. It catches the wind and then turns my head that way. And you know, on a motorcycle, if you turn your head, that's where the motorcycle goes, right? So, oh, crazy. I'm having to like tuck down, oh, you can, oh. Ah. I kept getting hammered around as I tried to make my way east. Eventually the wind died down and I found myself on a huge dry lake bed. The Alvor Desert is the largest playa lake in Oregon, receiving just 7 inches of rain a year. The surface of the lake is as flat as a pancake and as dry as a piece of toast. These conditions make it ideal for blasting around on a bike or even in a car. In fact, there's been a few land speed records that have been set here. In 1976, Kitty O'Neill set a land speed record by driving her rocket power car to a top speed of 621 miles per hour. Unfortunately, land speed records and 500cc motorcycles are usually not uttered in the same sentence, but I had fun zipping around on the donkey while enjoying the tranquility of the Alvor Desert. In 1986, Life magazine dubbed Highway 50 as the loneliest road in America and warned its readers not to travel on here as there were no points of interest. 
And in looking at the map, Highway 50 didn't exactly strike me as a motorcycling heaven. With its dead straight roads and desert-like conditions, it seemed better suited for RVs instead of motorcycles. But I did notice that it was built following the old route of the Pony Express. And to be honest, like most motorcyclists, I like to think I could have made it as a cowboy, so I decided to check out this historic highway. Highway 50 officially starts in Carson City, Nevada and runs all the way to the Great Basin National Park. But I will be starting my trip at the Stokes Castle just outside of Austin. Sitting high on a ridge overlooking the small town of Austin, the Stokes Castle was built in 1897 as a summer home by Anson Stokes, a local mine developer, railroad magnate, and banker. Unfortunately for the Stokes family, shortly after the completion of the castle, the local silver mines dried up and with that went the fortunes of the small town of Austin. Once a lucrative mining town, Austin is now increasingly deserted, currently with a population of just 167, down from a peak of over 7,000 back in 1863. Not a lot looks open in a uh, little tiny town of Austin. That's my destination for the today, Eli. And <laughs> that's where I'm headed straight for a long time on Highway 50, the loneliest highway in America. The history of the loneliest highway in America has its origins in the inception of the iconic Pony Express. The Pony Express was a horse-mounted mail service that operated between St. Joseph, Missouri and Sacramento, California. It was created as a direct result of the 1849 gold rush that saw thousands of prospectors move across the country in search of a better life. Traditional cross-country mail by stagecoach took about one month, but the Pony Express was able to reduce that time to just 10 days, which was incredibly fast for its time they did this by riding horses at breakneck speed for 10 to 15 miles before arriving at a relay station, jumping on a new horse and galloping off again. Most of the Pony Express riders were in their early 20s and they faced all sorts of hardships from dangerous weather, navigation errors to hostile bandits. While the Pony Express operated for only one year, it played a vital role in connecting the young country together and came to symbolize the adventurous spirit of the Wild West. Club Saloon Restaurant. In 1864, as the town of Austin was booming, several prospectors made their way east in search of less crowded diggings. I can relate to that. Their eureka moment came shortly after when they discovered a silver strike that would go on to become one of the largest in the state's history. It's not hard to see where the town of Eureka got its name, is it? Actually, originally they were going to call it, holy shit, we're going to be rich. But then they decided they didn't want to advertise how much silver they found. And I actually just totally made that up. <laughs> but much to the chagrin of the original prospectors and introverts everywhere in the world, others followed and soon the town's population grew to over 9,000. In its heyday, Eureka was one of the largest settlements in the area with over 100 saloons, dozens of gambling halls, multiple newspapers, hotels, restaurants, and even an opera house. The opera house was one of the main attractions as it brought Victorian high culture to the Wild West in the form of dances, operas, and masquerade balls. You can still see the signatures of past performers scribbled on these historic walls. The Eureka Sentinel Museum is home to what was once the Eureka Sentinel newspaper. What started out as a weekly pamphlet during the town's early days expanded to a full-blown daily newspaper by 1871. And with over 100 saloons in the town, you can bet there was a lot to talk about. The original newsroom from the 1800s have been fully preserved and is an amazing glimpse into what life looked like in those early days. This is what Instagram looked like in the 1800s.
What a fantastic little bit of history in this town. I love it. That, uh, uh, the uh, stage in the opera house is just fantastic. It has that old vaudeville type look to it, you know? I just love, maybe I'm old, I'm getting old. I just love old history. Analog history, like that printing press. The guy has to make each letter in metal. You can't undo, you can't make a mistake, you can't copy and paste. That's craftsmanship. It's unbelievable. What a fantastic little town. So, now I head back onto the highway, the dead straight baking hot sun highway towards Ely. You made it! Welcome to downtown, downtown Ely. Yay, made it! This is downtown Ely. 24 hour massage, VIP massage. Yeah, that place looks legit. <laughs> I would have liked a massage. Mr. G's. What is this, strip club? Interesting. Casinos, strip clubs, massage. It's like a mini Vegas. The Nevada Northern Railway owes its beginnings to the discovery of large copper deposits near Ely in the early 1900s. The railway was active from 1906 to 1983, but dwindling copper reserves made it commercially unviable. These days, it operates as a working museum with train rides into the local mountains and an active train yard that you can walk around. You know, there's very few train yards left in America that work on steam engines and even fewer that allow you to walk around the yard and talk to the engineers. So I absolutely had a blast checking out this historic train yard. You know, I absolutely love trains. I will visit any train museum <laughs> I can because something about the size of it, the scale of it, I just love the engineering that goes into these things. It was fantastic to be able to see the train and engines up close. Like, did you see the size of that turbo? Oh my God. Oh man, I need that turbo with this stupid slow bike. But anyways, that's Eli, Nevada. A fantastic stop on the loneliest highway in America. Now I'm heading back out on the road to my next stop, which takes me underground. My last stop on the loneliest highway takes me deep underground into the Lehman Caves. Discovered in 1885 by Absalom Lehman, a local rancher and miner, the caves extend about a quarter of a mile under the Great Basin National Park. What we see today actually began thousands of years ago when acidic water from the surface seeped into the ground and began dissolving the soluble rock. Eventually the water drained out forming these huge caves and over centuries as new water migrated downward from the surface it carried small amounts of limestone that drop by drop formed these magnificent stalactites and stalagmites. I was amused to learn that the Lehman Caves were actually used as a speakeasy during the Prohibition era. And given how challenging it was for us to get into the caves, I wonder how many Prohibition patrons might still be wandering around in the darkness. That was pretty cool. You need to go underground like that and kind of see how nature forms itself. I mean, it's a whole other world down there that we don't normally see when we're above, above ground, obviously, right? So I remember as a kid, I always used to like exploring caves and whatnot, trying to fit into the smallest spots. Now I'm older, now I'm all claustrophobic, now I don't want to do it anymore, but uh, this area is really interesting. I read online, I don't know if it's these trees or not, but there's this tree around here, I think it's called the bristlecone pine tree. These trees apparently live 3,000 years. That is amazing. I'm almost near the end of the loneliest highway in America, and I gotta say, it's actually been pretty cool. I'm heading back on the highway and heading to do some riding in Moab. So I've got a bunch more highway riding to do. And the next state is the state of Utah. And I'm going to be riding in Moab. Whoa, a bee just about flew into my helmet. Holy crap. Okay, trying to put this down. 
Despite Life Magazine's claim, I found Highway 50 to be really interesting. It has numerous points of interest and provides a fascinating look into an important part of American history. There's actually a lot more to see and do on the highway than what I've shown in this video, and I encourage you to grab a copy of the official survival guide and discover the loneliest road in America for yourself. Just make sure to add some highway pegs to your bike first. And that is the end of Nevada and the start of Utah and the end of the loneliest highway in America. Moab. Millions of years of flooding and desertification has created a land before time where the fingerprints of Jurassic giants are still visible in the earth. Vast open landscapes filled with towering natural arches, smooth red-walled canyons, and slick sand rock has created a paradise for off-road enthusiasts. I've been wanting to ride Moab for a long time, but I knew that the donkey would not cut it on these trails. I also knew that I had actually no idea where to go, so I hired Andy from Rocky Tracks to show me around. Not only did he bring a wealth of knowledge of the local trail networks, but a brand new Kawasaki KLX for me to ride. Look at that. I mean, it's such a cliche, but that rock is pretty dang slick looking. Hence the name Slick Rock, but still, look how smooth it is. That is way bumpier than I thought it would be. Boy, when you watch a video on YouTube, it doesn't look bumpy at all. Jeez, that was scary. There's no guardrail to the left. If you fall, you're going into that dry lake bed. Man, that view is epic. Sand, 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 not my favorite. Oh shit. Oh shit. So it turns out that Moab is a lot harder to ride than I anticipated as evidenced by my dead action cab. Um, here's the deal. When I was putting this trip together, the whole focus of the trip was to go to Moab because I've always wanted to ride Moab. In fact, when I started mountain biking a few years ago, that's when my interest in Moab started to come about because I remember seeing video clips on YouTube of people mountain biking in Moab. It just, it looks so different than what we ride in BC. And one of the trails that I was looking forward to riding the most was called the Slick Rock Trail. Now think about that name for a second. If someone told you they're gonna ride a trail called the Slick Rock Trail, how hard does that trail sound? It doesn't sound very hard at all, right? It's called the Slick Rock Trail. If that trail was called the, the, the Gnarly Rock Trail or the, like the Bumpy Rock Trail or something like that, then yeah, that sounds like a pretty difficult trail, right? But if a trail is called Slick Rock Trail, doesn't sound that difficult. I And I watched a bunch of videos on YouTube of people riding the Slick Rock Trail, and I thought, how hard can that be? Because it's Slick Rock. In BC, our trails are never smooth. They're never slick. They're always bumpy and rocky and we got roots and rocks and all kinds of stuff in there. So when I looked at Moab, to me, it, it, it looked like riding on the surface of an egg. Like I just thought it was just like a bunch of eggs everywhere. Like everything is smooth and you're just basically going up and down, up and down. Turns out I couldn't be further from the truth. What you don't notice in those YouTube videos, you don't notice until you get there, is how bumpy is not the right word, but how uneven 
The surface is. Oh, this is way bumpier than I thought. Holy crap. Which line do I take? This one here? Oh my God. So Moab was like a really big challenge for me. And uh, it was actually kind of disappointing to be honest because I thought Moab would be fantastic. Like I had all these ideas for drone shots and all this kind of stuff and I was gonna film like this epic thing and none of it turned out. The drone was overheating. My phone that I used to control the drone was overheating because it was so hot there so I, I couldn't use the drone that much. Like I, I didn't really get a lot of good GoPro footage because I was like looking down most of the time at the trail. But the, the good thing is I kind of realize now what my limitations are and what I need to work on because you know when you watch those BDR videos and they go to like super remote places in like North America or you see these guys like super remote places in like Nepal or something man that looks exciting right like I want to go there but I realize now like that's actually probably a lot more challenging than I realize or than the video makes it look so I, if I was to plan a route like that I gotta be a lot I gotta I gotta improve my off-road skill level quite a bit actually you know I gotta watch more of that Brett Tax the, the hat guy video I gotta, I gotta study more of his videos I gotta perfect my hat technique and then I'll, then I'll be good for off-road but uh, yeah off-road stuff man is not ever challenging but uh, anyways the good news is the rest of the trip should be super easy. I've got Colorado tomorrow and then I got Wyoming. And even though some of those areas are off-road, I don't think it'll be as difficult as, as it was in Moab. And I don't think I'm gonna have any problems with the rest of the trip. As I left Moab and made my way south to Colorado, my streak of good weather seemed to be coming to an end. Black clouds formed in the sky as I rode south to Highway 550, also known as the Million Dollar Highway. I mean, it looks fine over there, right? Look at that! Oh my god! I hope that's kind of behind me and that's not coming this way. Because that is a lot of gray. That's a lot of precipitation coming down. Oh my god. No one really knows how this 25 mile stretch of road between Silverton and Uruguay came to be known as the Million Dollar Highway. Some say that the gravel required to build the road contained over a million dollars worth of gold and silver. Another theory is that back when it was a wagon trail, the locals would claim that they wouldn't drive on this dangerous road even for a million bucks. It's funny how so many of these old wagon trails have turned into fantastic motorcycle roads. Today, the Million Dollar Highway is well known as one of the most spectacular rides in America. However, with the weather looking questionable, I wasn't sure what kind of million dollar experience I was going to have as I rode into Silverton. The town of Silverton, Colorado looks like a cowboy era movie set. Dirt streets, buildings with that classic western false front and steam locomotives all harken back to a bygone era. Look at this old Grand Imperial Hotel. That's cool looking. Lone Spur Cafe. Oh, I gotta go have lunch at the Lone Spur Cafe. That sounds perfect. Fittingly, I decided to stop for lunch at the Lone Spur Cafe and listen to local pianist Lacey Black entertain the patrons with her ragtime tunes. After lunch, I officially started on the Million Dollar Highway, only to be met with torrential rain and an annoying amount of traffic. Boy, this would be a lot of fun if it was dry road. Highway 550 didn't turn out to be the million dollar experience that I was hoping for, but the burgers and tunes in Silvertown more than made up for it. Bear Creek Trailhead Tunnel. That's a pretty short tunnel. But, do you know what we do with tunnels? <laughs> That's the Million Dollar Highway. And this is the town of your way. Well, I don't know if that highway is worth a million dollars. If it was no traffic, yeah, it might be a lot of fun. But with the amount of traffic on there, and the, that's kind of boring. I actually prefer the McKenzie Highway one much more than that one. 
I'd probably, if, if there's no traffic, I'd do it from your way to Silverton. I think that'd be a funner route because you're climbing more. Oh, look at that opera house. Known as a Switzerland of America due to its many mountain passes, your way is a popular destination for off-road enthusiasts. Whether you're on two wheels or four, the local mountain passes offer stunning views of the San Juan mountain range. Unfortunately, due to the bad weather, I just ended up doing laundry. With laundry done and the weather clearing up, it was time for me to hit the dirt. Okay, enough of this pavement stuff. Since I'm in Colorado, home of the Rocky Mountains, let's get off the pavement and check out some of the dirt roads. The plan for the day was to ride over the Owl Creek Pass and make my way to the small town of Gunnison. How's it going, cows? Hehehe, <laughs> so cute. You guys take it easy, it's no big deal. Don't be so scared, buddy. Where are you going? All your buddies went that way. Yeah, okay. It's okay, buddy. It's okay. See ya. Owl Creek Pass is a well-maintained gravel mountain road that offers scenic views of the Cimarron mountain range. In fact, this area was used to film scenes from two classic cowboy movies, True Grit and How the West Was Won, starring John Wayne. I wasn't able to give the amazing views my full attention though as my focus was drawn to a strange rattle that I heard coming from my bike. What the f is that buzzing? I don't know what the f that is. Is it from the front? Is it that? Is it this? Oh, it's that. Oh, shit. Okay, wow. I continued on my way wondering how I was going to fix my bike when an unlikely solution presented itself in the form of a stranger walking on the side of the road. Why is this old woman like riding, walking in the middle of nowhere here? That's rather interesting. Hello. Good. Well, the lady that was walking, her name is Sandy. She told me that there's a guy up here who's kind of a local mechanic. And he might be able to fix my loose crash bar. She says there's a big open field on the left. Pickup trucks and RVs. And it might start raining, and the road is getting bump bumpier, she said. Oh, it's probably this guy here. Let's go find out. Excuse me. Hi there. A lady named Sandy suggested to come here and that there might be a mechanic who might be able to fix something on my bike. <laughs> Okay, so he's it'll be an hour. Yeah, tell Morgan, tell Morgan it'll be an hour because he's all the way up here in Silver Jacket. Um, so it'd be an hour, and I'm sending him your way. Thank you guys, appreciate it. Well, that's interesting. Thanks to that lady who was out for a hike. I met Pete, the mechanic, and he's going to introduce me to Morgan, the other mechanic who's hopefully going to be able to fix my bike. I bet that happened in Oregon. Oh. Holy shit! That broke that thing right off! Look at that! I can't see that these roads would do that. That 15 kilometers of washboard probably broke it. Realizing that it was the washboard roads in Oregon that broke my bike, I gingerly made my way across the washboard roads to Highland Cycles. I couldn't be more grateful for the team at Highland Cycles for fitting me in and doing a fantastic job of getting me back on the road. Thumbs up to those guys. 
What a crazy day. What are you doing to me, Colorado? So now that the donkey is uh, back to working order, I'm heading back towards Gunnison, which is where I was originally going to stay before I had that detour. And the guys at the shop, they told me a different route. Instead of heading back on Highway 50, they told me to take this highway, which I think was, uh, I can't remember, 192, 93 or something like that. This highway, they said, is a lot more fun. So let's hope for no more issues in Colorado. The Million Dollar Highway might have been a bust, but Highway 92 more than made up for it with its fun twisty roads and no traffic. This road is endless. Good Lord. Good Lord. Boy, one momentary lapse of concentration and uh, you're off the line. I was having a blast until I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. You're either doing the tumble down to the, whoa, holy shit. Wait a minute. Turns out that Highway 92 follows the Gunnison River, which is part of the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park. Holy crap, I just saw it to the bottom of this canyon. I didn't realize that. Oh my God. Look at this. Look at this canyon. Holy crap. The park's unique name is due to the fact that the canyon being so deep and narrow that the walls are often covered in shadow. Despite some weather challenges, I enjoyed the amazing scenery that Colorado has to offer. And thanks to the help from some friendly locals, I was able to get my bike fixed and continue on my way. Oh my God, what a day today turned out to be. <laughs> this trip has been a very weird trip. But now I am in Gunnison. I'm gonna find some food, I'm gonna get some gas. I'm going to find some food and I'm going to find my hotel before that rain cloud arrives. <laughs> After a long and very unpredictable day, I finally made it to my hotel room in Gunnison. I can't imagine anything going wrong in Wyoming. The place I'm staying at has all these deer statues. So when I came out of my room and I saw these guys, I was like, wait a minute. Are those statues? No, wait, they're moving. <laughs> okay, another day in the saddle. As you can see, the bike is pretty damp. Ew, that's soaking wet. I don't want to sit on that. <laughs> Let's uh, get this thing started. Wyoming is the 10th largest state in America, but with a population of just over half a million, it is also the least populated state. It's the perfect place for an introvert who likes riding alone. My route through Wyoming would take me from the south to the north along a series of paved and gravel roads. And given the issues that I've had in Moab and Colorado, I'm really crossing my fingers that nothing goes wrong in Wyoming. There's the sun, look at that. Oh my God, I gotta stop and take a look at that. Oh my God. Look how green everything is here. You can see it's starting to change to yellow. Oh, so cold. The sunrise coming over the horizon was just absolutely stunning and I had to stop and take a picture and say hi to these friendly horses. Hey, there you go. Oh, hey, pet you too. Oh so soft oh. I'll see you later yeah okay bye guys soon enough it was time to get off the pavement and hit the dirt Due to how sparse Wyoming is, they have this huge network of dirt roads that crisscross the state with these really interesting roadside information plaques. From here you can see three different mountain ranges. Direction in front of you is the Magnuson Wind River Range. I guess it's that one right there. To the far left is the Wyoming Range. I don't see anything. You can see the Unita U U huh? Range. <laughs> I don't see any mountain ranges here, Wyoming. 
All I see is a lot of flat area with a big giant rock thingy right there. Given how flat the surrounding area was, I was surprised to see this lone rock formation sticking up in the middle of nowhere. And since it didn't look that far away, I decided to go check it out. I want to see that giant rock thing he's sticking out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I thought this was the way to go to it, but I could be wrong. Where am I? That's it there. So, 1.8 kilometers, about 2 kilometers. Okay. Oh man, I don't want to get stuck in some sand or something. I should try it. It's pretty dry out here though. Okay, let me go like a few feet in and see what I can do. My big ass heavy cases on my bike. Oh, oh, can I do this? Is this a stupid idea? I don't know, we'll find out I guess. Come on, come on adventure bike. Oh, okay, 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 I gotta pay attention. I gotta seriously pay attention. If I get stuck in sand, I'm screwed. Oh, coming up on a water crossing. Coming up on a, you know what? I better actually slow down, because that could be mud. That could be, whoa, whoa, ah, oh, shit, damn it, oh, no. Oh, I gotta turn my bike off. Oh, I turned off. Ah. <laughs> okay. I was just joking to say that was a water crossing, but you know what? That's pretty... Oh, that's pretty muddy. I, I, I turned my bike off. That's pretty muddy. Yep, those tires are not going to go through that. Okay. Let's see if I can lift this bike. I don't know where to grab it. Okay, okay. Shit. It's sliding. When I push back, it slides in the mud. Uh-oh. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, oh, there we go, here we go, here we go, is the kickstand on this side, oh shit, it's on the other side, oh, I should have put the kickstand down first, oh, that was kind of stupid, holy crap, look at this mud, oh my god, it's like glue, can I get through here, I can't go back, I have to go forward, I have... oh shit, okay, okay, that was stupid, I was going to show you how it's like, oh, Oh shit, that's heavy. Damn. Oh, stupid. Oh. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Okay. Okay. Shit, what should I do? I don't think I can get in there. Because... Well, I made it that far. Shit, it won't start with the kickstand. <laughs> Holy crap. This was stupid. I gotta wash my bike after this is covered in mud. What if I put this rock down by the tire? Can it get a little bit of traction on this tire is that gonna is that gonna be dumb i don't know come on oh, come. Ah. there we go come on come on oh. Oh my god, that was the hardest thing I think I've ever done on this bike. Oh. You butthole! Holy crap, look at my shoes, my boots, look at my bike, look at every tire! <laughs> yeah, that's a slick. I gotta wash my bike after this, I don't know where to wash it. I'm going to Atlantic City, there's no place to wash it there. Okay. Despite the challenge of the mud hole, I was determined to make my way to the rock thingy. I continued following the dotted lines of the map, but didn't seem to be getting any closer when suddenly the tracks just disappeared. Where's the trail? Oh, it's to the left. Okay, this is stupid. I need to take a break. I need to take a break. Oh my God, I'm sweating like crazy. I'm so hot. Oh, 
feels so good. Oh, that wind feels so good. Okay, so I am here and the dotted line is over there. So somehow I guess I must have missed it somehow, but there's a bit of a trail here. So I basically need to point this arrow towards that red line. I want to go towards that red line. Not wanting to push my luck any further, I decided that the safe choice was to turn back and head towards the main road. Hmm, I don't seem to be getting any closer to the road. In fact, I seem to be going the wrong way. You know what, I should go back because at least I know how to get back. Oh, this is it, this is it, this is it. Okay, okay, so how am I gonna do this? First, I think I'll go. Jesus Christ, there's a big hole there. Why is there a giant hole right there? Holy crap. Okay, I'm gonna go on the right side. First, right side. But that looks awfully squishy too, doesn't it? Let's walk it, let's see what happens. Okay, let's, let's just, let's just see what happens. Okay, if I can get to here, I think this will be okay. How do I get to here? Oh, maybe right there. That line right down the side there. Stay out of that, stay in that, I think. Okay, let me try. Just to slowly creep in, creep in. Oh, stupid bush, get out of my way. Oh shit, my foot is slipping. There we go. Oh yeah! Woohoo! Oh, I made it! Oh god, how long did that take me? 30 seconds, maybe less? It took me like, what, an hour on the other side? <laughs> Note to self. Avoid the side that has lots of mud on it. Oh, gravel road! I've never been so happy to see a gravel road in my entire life. Ah, oh, gravel road! It turns out that that rock thingy is called a boar's tusk, which is a cool ass name by the way, and it's the remnants of an old volcano. Heavily eroded now, all that remains is the erosion resistant center core that dates back to over two and a half million years. It's actually a popular landmark for local hikers and climbers, and you can actually drive up to it and climb it if you want. Just make sure you know where you're going and you avoid the mud holes. Can you see it? That's highway. Needing to clean off the bike and reorient myself, I looked on Google Maps for anything that resembled civilization and saw that I was close to the town of Farson. This is Farson. Uh, that's Farson. If I zoom in, I mean, that's it. There's the mercantile, and that's it. There's not even a gas station or anything around here. Now, Farson turned out to be less of a town and more of just an intersection. But with the local mercantile making sandwiches, I knew that it was a perfect place for me to stop for lunch. Thank you very much. Is that very nice lady inside? Oh my God, this is the tourist center as well. So this basically is Farson. This building is Farson. It's a mercantile tourist center. Now, motorcycle car wash. She said, that I could use her hose back here to rinse off my bike. Great, we have water. Okay, let's get some hose action. According to a government census done in 2010, Atlantic City had a population of 37 residents. Clearly, they have experienced a population boom since then. Welcome to Atlantic City. Population 57. Population 58 for tonight. Atlantic City is a popular stopping point for hikers and cyclists who are following the Continental Divide Trail. I met Mike Gribble, who is one of the brave cyclists following the 3,000 mile route that stretches across the United States from the border of Canada to Mexico. And if that wasn't challenging enough, Clay Jacobson decided that he wanted to hike the entire distance. We joked over breakfast that I'd be comfortably back home in Canada before he'd even hit the halfway mark on his trip. He shared with me some of the amazing photos that he has on his Instagram and I wish him Godspeed on his journey. Oh, okay. I guess I'm staying in one of these cabins. 
The Miner's Delight Inn has become a favorite restaurant for ADV riders after the opening of the Wyoming BDR route, and I was happy to hunker down for the night in one of their cozy cabins. After a hearty breakfast, I was back on the road and onto the highway this time as my route took me through the Teton and Yellowstone National Parks. What a cool little B&B that is. Today is just easy, easy, easy day. Grinding out the miles, hoping nothing breaks. It's really a shame that the GoPro doesn't show scale well, doesn't show distance well, because you just cannot appreciate the scale of this area when you're looking at it from a GoPro. I mean, I just had to stop here and look at this. As far as my eyeball can see, that's Wyoming. That way, that way, and that way. And that way too, but there's a mountain in the way. Look at this place. It's just so vast, so vast. Yellowstone National Park may be world famous, but with the amount of traffic and construction that was going on, it was a jarring contrast to the peaceful and isolated roads that I'd just ridden. Not wanting to spend my day stuck behind a line of cars, I got the token photo of the sleepy American bison and left the park as quickly as I could. A large part of the lore of the American Wild West can be attributed to William Frederick Cody, also known as Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill was a cowboy, soldier, and showman who founded the Wild West show that featured sharpshooting, rope tricks, buffalo hunting, and reenactments of historical American events. His show toured throughout America and Europe and was immensely popular in bringing the frontier life to a global audience. His romantic images of the Wild West would shape Hollywood cowboy movies for decades to come. I wonder what he'd think of a modern cowboy movie. I bet he would love Tombstone with Val Kilmer because everybody loves that movie. While on a trip to Yellowstone, Cody was so impressed with the area that he decided to start a town named after himself, of course. Today, Cody, Wyoming is a growing town and home to the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, a massive, massive complex that is home to five distinct museums. Founded in 1917 to preserve the legacy of William Cody, the center contains the Buffalo Bill Museum, the Plains Indian Museum, the Whitney Western Art Museum, the Draper Natural History Museum, and the Cody Firearms Museum. I'm telling y'all, this place is huge. After a few practice rounds at the museum, I felt that I was ready to test my cowboy sharpshooting skills at the Cody Firearms Experience. My instructor for the day was Matthew and I could immediately tell that he was very knowledgeable about guns due to the length of his beard and the fact that he was wearing a sheriff's badge. I had a lot of fun shooting a variety of guns from different eras, starting with the 1860 Henry rifle, then a World War II era M1 Garand. That's fun. Here we go. Last one. Get ready for the ping. <laughs> no, I definitely want one. And then finally, a modern FNP-90. I really felt that I was getting closer to my cowboy dreams. Do I look like Clint Eastwood yet? I don't know. <laughs> Not I yet. I mean, I think you're about a foot shorter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Of course, I couldn't leave without having a go at firing the Gatling gun. and giving the shop dog some pets. Aren't you adorable? Little beagle. Oh my God, that was so much fun. As I rode out of Cody and into the mountains, I reflected on how much I enjoyed my time in Wyoming. The vast open spaces, friendly people, 
and historical ties to the founding of America all gave Wyoming that distinctive feel of the fabled land of the free. The Beartooth Highway is an all-American road in a section of U.S. Highway 212 that leads from Wyoming into Montana. It has been called one of the most beautiful drives in America with breathtaking views of the Beartooth Mountains. Unfortunately for me, all this stunning scenery was hidden behind a thick soup of Montana fog. just totally come out of fog like that before. Huh, and that was all sunny on this side. So far on this trip, I've ridden the historic route of the Pony Express traveled over wagon mountain passes, shot Clint Eastwood's gun, and now there was just one thing left to do to fulfill my cowboy dreams. No image is more enshrined into the history of the American Wild West than that of a cowboy galloping across the Great Plains on his horse. I booked myself a tour at a local ranch and as I descended down from the Beartooth Highway, I imagined myself in full cowboy mode, my cowboy hat on, six shooter in hand, galloping across the Montana outback, the horse thundering below me. Unfortunately for me, the reality didn't quite live up to the Hollywood image that I had in my head. Due to some issues that the company had, our mountain trail ride turned into a roadside walk. They made me wear this dorky helmet and we just ambled around the countryside for a bit before heading back to the stables. As I made my way out of Montana and into Idaho, I had one last road that I wanted to ride. Well, I guess this is the start of Lolo Pass. Lolo Pass is a mountain pass located on the border of Montana and Idaho that spans over 150 miles from beginning to end. That's right, y'all, 150 miles of twisty mountain road. Doesn't get any better than that. Entering Pacific Time Zone. Welcome to Idaho. Looks like Montana. <laughs> Lolo Pass turned out to be one of my favorite roads on this trip. Gorgeous scenery, a fun twisty road, helpful road signs, and hardly any traffic was a fantastic way to close out my American road trip. I love the signage here in Idaho. So descriptive. You know, it tells you exactly what you're going to see here. Check out this sign. Check out this sign. This sign is hilarious. <laughs> what is this? Some kind of river or some kind of forest or something? No, nope. it's Wilderness! <laughs> that's awesome! Yep, that's called Wilderness! <laughs> Got it! Thanks, Idaho! You know, I was just thinking to myself, like, I wonder how long this road goes on for. I just saw a sign that said, like, the Cuckoo, what's the name of this place? Whatever this place is called, is about 60. It says 60. So I was thinking to myself, okay, it's about 60 kilometers away. Yeah, maybe another 20 minutes or so. But then I remembered, wait a minute, I'm in the States. <laughs> That's 60 miles. That's 100K. And I'm averaging about 100K an hour. So that means like another hour of this stuff. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, city center. Next up. I think that's the end of the Lolo Pass Highway there. The city of Kuskia. This is where it ends. 
What an absolutely amazing road that was. That was incredibly fun. So this is the town of Kuskia, population 607. And I believe this is the gas station here. And I'm gonna get gas and then go continue on my way. After 4,500 miles and eight states, it was time for me to head home. I am still blown away that this is Washington State. I gotta take a closer look at this whole tractor. Is it chain drive? No. What's the chain for? Huh? Does he, is that how he steers? No way. So he would turn his wheel, that would turn that, that would turn that, which turns that, which then pulls the chain on this side, and it turns that way. Is that ever interesting? I guess this is a steam tractor? Good Lord, is that ever cool. Case. I made my way across Washington State, stopping just for gas, and eventually made it to Port Angeles, the starting and ending point of this trip. Welcome to Port Angeles, right there. Yay, made it, end of my trip. Okasan, Japanese restaurant. <laughs> That's a funny name for a Japanese restaurant. Okasan means mother in Japanese. <laughs> oh, here. Hi there. Hi there. Got a reservation? No. All right, no worries. I can get you on this one. You can park in that motorcycle box right there. Okay. And then just come inside here with your ride can and your passport after. Okay, cool. With my ticket purchased, I grabbed a quick lunch, and soon it was time for me to board the Coho Ferry back to Vancouver Island. After disembarking back on Canadian soil, I thought back on my trip. My goals on this trip were to find myself or learn some big life lesson. My goals were to simply see some amazing scenery, learn a little bit about American history, and have fun riding my motorcycle. As I pulled into my driveway, I was already thinking about my next road trip and how for sure I wouldn't be riding the donkey. Well, 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 what do we have here? <laughs>